Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to this interview series here on the channel. I have the very great pleasure this afternoon to be joined by Donya Mighty, who is a current qualified physician associate, just started a new job, I believe, working in a GP practice as a PA, and she's very shortly going to be making the switch to graduate entry medicine. So in this interview, we are going to have a look at the role of a PA, maybe why they were introduced, the training pathway, what they do in practice, and then Donya's own journey as a PA and why she's deliberated about making that switch. Donya, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So I guess the, the first place to start would be, given that this is something that myself and many other people in, in the healthcare world don't have much of a grasp on, what exactly is a physician associate? Mm, okay, so a physician associate, it's, um, it's a fairly new medical profession. Um, but it's actually been around in the States since the 1960s. Um, and I believe it started in the military. It's like a shorter training pathway to get people working um, alongside the doctors to support the medical team. Mm -hmm. So it's been in the UK, I think, for about 13 to 15 years now. Um, essentially, it's geared at people who have done an undergraduate degree, either in like a science or healthcare subject, to do a two-year postgraduate master's level degree um, and essentially be doing things like taking histories, performing exams, um, initiating investigations, proposing management for patients, and really just helping out the medical team, either in a hospital or in a GP practice. Excellent. So I guess, um, and th this is something that I, I need to be careful of getting too much into, but what would you say is, just because it's such a new role and... Um, mm -hmm people that we don't really have that common mentality I think among the workforce of the level at which PAs operate um, sure. what might be the most comparable profession you, you know that exists uh, that has mm. existed if that makes sense I suppose the closest comparison would be to doctors um, because PAs do work um, alongside the medical team um, but it's really difficult to say because they work at different levels. So a PA that has been experienced for, say, five to ten years, they might be working at the level of a registrar in the field that they're working in, whereas a newly graduated PA would be working more at the level of an F1, F2 doctor. Sure. Um, and it, it was interesting to get into the, the history of the profession almost. Um, mm -hmm. And I think just as a, as a, a quick thing to, to maybe have a talk about. Uh, my understanding is, uh, as you described during, was it the Second World War, First or Second World War, when yeah. there was a lack of, of kind of urgent care providers yeah. um, who, who needed to be able to perform these tasks at the level of a doctor, but we didn't have time, or the Americans didn't have time to train uh, as many MDs that quickly. Um, and it's only a two year program, mm -hmm. you know, how, are you able to just tell us a little bit about you know the pace of the course or how do they how do they compress that timeline sure um i think the first thing to say is obviously we don't learn everything in the degree it's impossible to learn everything you know the vast majority of things you'll learn on the job but the main purpose of the degree is to give you enough knowledge in order to recognize your own scope of practice and to practice safely um, so the intensity of the degree is two years in length and both years are 45 weeks a year. So you have just two weeks off for Christmas, Easter and the summer. Um, so it's fairly fast paced. Um, there's not much time off. Um, and you do back to back rotations in the second year of the programme. So you'll be going through sort of all the medical and surgical um, areas. You'll be doing uh, things like paediatrics, psychiatry. So you'll have like tasters in sort of all the different areas that you could potentially be working in. The first year of the course tends to be mainly theory based. So you'd mm -hmm. be in university attending lectures, doing things like PBL. Um, and you will have sort of some GP days here and there as well. Um, but it depends, I guess all programmes are structured slightly differently. So I studied at the University of the West of England. Um, so that was how the course was structured there. But I know some of the universities have structured it slightly differently. But that's the main sort of overview of how it takes place. Something that, that I hear a lot, and I'm still not 100% sure what it means, although based on what you've just said, I mean, it, I hear that PAs are trained according to a, a medical 
model of kind of um, mm -hmm. this problem-based diagnosis. And what you've just described sounds very similar to the core structure of a medical degree, you know, this preclinical yeah. kind of book heavy um, first part and then a clinical uh, second part. Are you able to, to elaborate any more on what exactly the medical model means in this context? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's it's the same way that you'd perhaps be taught at university as well. So um, in terms of, I'll just go through what our um, PBL sessions sure. are like, for example. Um, so we'd be presented with a case at the start of the week. Um, we might be told a little bit about the patient. Um, and then we'd sit down in our groups and we'd sort of start thinking broadly about, you know, what this particular symptom could be. So we'd start thinking about all of, you know, like a surgical sieve we'd use. Um, and sort of expand from there and then you'd be told a little bit more information sort of the subsequent two sessions we would have and then we'd sort of close the case as well as a group. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you were hoping for me to Yeah, answer. Yeah sure I mean the distinction that often gets made is it seems that in healthcare when you, you look at the broad strokes of things you either learn according to a nursing model like the nursing model of healthcare or a medical yeah. um, model of healthcare and I just kind of wish to, to make the point what what little I know about PAs and their training mm -hmm. is that they are they are trained very much according to the medical yeah. approach to problems rather than the, the nursing um, scope of practice, which obviously independently extremely valuable and, and we rely yeah. on both um, to do care. But it's just people I, I get a lot of questions from people asking me about you know the difference between medical school and PA school and, and all this and mm. I've, I've never been in much of a position to, to kind of answer any of it um, yeah not knowing much about the PA courses I suppose another way to sort of look at that is in practice what a PA can do um, and how PAs work alongside the medical team so sure. certainly in my job in trauma and orthopedics I was working with trust grade doctors so they were working at sort of like CT1 level mm. um and there was no real difference in terms of our job roles day to day. The only difference is there are some limitations, things that PAs can't do at the moment. Okay. Um, so things like prescribing, um, requesting ionizing radiation and certifying death. Those are the three main things that PAs cannot do. Um, I guess the ionizing radiation thing is more to do with the regulatory aspect because yeah. physician associates are not regulated at the moment. Um, so the GMC will be regulating physician associates and that's hoping for it to happen sort of next year, 2021 is what they're aiming for. Um, so those are the main differences, the things that I, you know, I'm not able to do. Um, however, on the ward, I would work pretty much the same as the junior doctors I was working alongside with so uh, you know we'd do ward rounds in the morning we'd have an MDT meeting um, I would look after my own bay of patients they would look after their bay of patients so you know day to day there's not a massive difference um, it's just it's a different pathway and I suppose in the scope of in terms of progression it's different as well. Yeah um, ju just to clarify again for people listening at home what Donnie was saying about CT1s um, there you know certainly if PAs are working alongside CT1s and doing a lot of the same duties it's important to appreciate that a CT1 is is a, a pretty experienced doctor by that point right so you do your you finish medical school which could be five or six or four five or six years of uh, full-time education then you're going to do your foundation one your foundation two most people now are choosing to take foundation three as well for various reasons which may be clinical or it may not and then you would progress to that core training ct1 ct2 level so we're actually not talking about the most junior of doctors there we're talking about you know confident getting ready to enter specialty training um so i didn't realize that the the, the pa role was quite as you know it had that that scope to practice at that level mm -hmm if that made sense, but that's really interesting. I suppose I'm, I'm trying to think how to, how to ask this set of questions sensitively and diplomatically, but I think it is important, particularly with what we're going to hopefully talk about in, in a few minutes. Yeah. I think it's fair to say among certainly a lot of the medical workforce, I can't speak for the nursing workforce, 
but mm. there is some skepticism about yeah. the introduction of PAs and my my take on my, my understanding of the situation is that it's nothing to do with the practitioners themselves I don't think anyone would argue that PAs don't perform a very valuable role and operate as very highly qualified practitioners okay. is there not animosity but there maybe misunderstandings about what you're there to do or what what's your relationship with doctors like day to day um okay so day to day my relationship with doctors has been absolutely fine i've had no problems personally as a qualified physician associate i did have some issues as a student physician associate when i was on the wards um and those issues came from both the nursing and the medical staff right um I've had lots of people ask me how much I get paid. I think that's another sort of bugbear for some people that physician associates get paid at Agenda for Change Band 7, um, which is higher than an F1 or an F2 doctor in terms of base salary. Um, but I think it's important to understand that there's at the moment, there's not a massive scope for pay progression for physician associates. So it doesn't yeah. go massively beyond that. Whereas um, you know, I guess it's aspirational for a junior doctor to know that at some point they're going to end up in a, hopefully a consultant post and be you know, much better paid. Um, so there definitely has been some scepticism. I think before people have worked with PAs, sometimes they tend to be sceptical. And once you've, you know, once I've been able to sort of prove myself and my worth and my knowledge, then there have been no problems from that point. Yeah. Um, but I think just as with anything, because it's a new profession, it's, you know, people are unsure, uncertain. And then there have been sort of articles in tabloid newspapers calling physician associates doctors on the cheap and things like that, um, which, you know, probably doesn't help. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So again, just to clear up um, for for those, particularly if you're you know you're at school and you're thinking about going into a, a a health career of some sort and you're not sure whether or not you might, it's a bit different, I suppose, because you can only do PA as a postgraduate, right? At the moment, you can actually do it as an undergrad. So there are um, yeah. So there's two programs that have recently started. One at uh, the University of Reading and another at UCLan, and um, they are four-year undergraduate PA programs. I see, okay, so they are, because presumably you don't have the undergraduate degree in that sense, and the, the experience of studying that you would otherwise, they yeah. are sort of decompressing the course, but it can take you to yeah. qualification, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Um, so that, that's news to me, there we go. Um, what typically happens in medicine or at least in in theory what is supposed to happen is that you do your medical school you do your foundation years and then at some point you will enter into specialty training um medical salaries are they're, they're certainly not low I, I wouldn't call you know junior doctor salaries low for an entry level job but they are compared to what you could earn in the private sector for the amount of training that you've done, they're not particularly competitive at the start. Mm -hmm. But as Donya kind of said, when you, you begin to do your specialty training and particularly when you become a consultant, that there is substantial pay progression um, as, as doctors move up their specialty. But that takes, you know, eight to 10 years of, of postgraduate training. Whereas they're, at the moment, I suppose, is, is there any granularity? Like, do you get more for being, say, an experienced PA? Can you take yeah. on more roles? You can, yeah. Um, they generally tend to be management roles. Um, so, like a senior or a lead PA, you may supervise a team of other PAs. Um, uh, or if you're sort of more experienced in certain procedures that you can learn, um, you may be paid at sort of Agenda for Change Band 8A after being qualified for about five years as a PA. But I think it's really under, um, important to understand sort of what the reason is for PAs have, for having been introduced into this country. So I suppose the main thing is um, shortages of the medical workforce in the NHS. Um, and that's really, I think, what has spurred the government on to introduce this role and to sort of get behind it and also it's important to understand that a lot of people that have come into the PA profession have previous experience in other healthcare roles not all of them but a lot of them have been either nurses or paramedics or radiographers and they have a wealth of NHS experience already 
Um, and another benefit to sort of the medical team to have a physician associate there is the continuity of care for patients. So whereas the juniors tend to rotate every few months, um, a PA would tend to be sort of a more permanent structure on the ward um, for the patients. So it's important to understand that as well. Very quickly before we move on to your own reasons for, for wanting to, mm -hmm. to make the jump to medicine. Um, you, you mentioned about ionizing radiation and the problems with that because what I can't assume to be the case is that if a PA is capable of practicing, you know, certainly at the level of an F1, F2, CT1, reg, whatever you like, um, the suggestion is not that they do not have the academic competence or, you know, professional competence to, to know essentially what they're, what they're doing. Um, and it's probably a regulatory problem with with the provision of radiation. How do you feel about prescribing? Do you think we'll see that change at the same pace? Um, not as quick as regulation. So I think regulation will come in next year, hopefully if it hasn't been delayed by COVID. Yeah. Um, prescribing, I think there will have to be another consultation after that. So it perhaps may take another few years for prescribing to come in for physician associates and at which point they'd have to sort of go back and do a non-medical prescribing course I would assume mm. in order to become a prescriber um yeah so I, I don't think it's going to happen yet but I think it will happen at some point um which sort of again leads on to one of my reasons for wanting to pursue graduate entry medicine sure Let, let's jump into that then that you know we're, <laughs> we're 25 minutes in the time the time has come um where to begin with this let, let's uh, I'm just very <laughs> conscious that this could be a bit of a minefield Donya why are you thinking about changing to graduate entry medicine okay so there's a few reasons um firstly prescribing um it's not going to happen yet for physician associates it hopefully will happen at some point uh, but my thinking is I can probably just become a doctor in that time and it probably still won't have happened. Yeah. Um, you know, I think paramedics had to wait, uh, wait a very long time to be able to prescribe. Um, and it's a daily frustration yeah. in the role. Um, I don't feel it as much now in GP because I think the way that we have sorted it out, it's fairly smooth. I work with the on-call doctor. Um, if I want to have something prescribed, I will just send an electronic request and the GP will approve it. Um, so it's actually not been a problem at all in GP. Um, in the hospital, it's difficult sometimes trying to find a doctor <laughs> to sign a prescription uh, can be quite challenging. And I suppose if you haven't worked with somebody before, they don't know your scope of practice, they don't you know, know what you're saying is 100% correct, there might be duplication of work. They might think, okay, well, I need to go and examine the patient and see if actually I do need to prescribe this. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's their name, isn't it? Their signature, their GMC registration. Yeah, that, that's something, again, very quickly, just point of information at home, guys. Um, it is, I think it's fair to say, common practice that if, if particularly nurses are the ones I've had more experience seeing this, if they, you know, they, their patient who they are looking after and they know far better than anyone else, um, because nurses spend 99% of the time looking after patients. You know, my patient's in pain. They need analgesia. They, even if it's something as simple as paracetamol, they have to have a doctor usually um, do that prescription. And if there's no doctor around, they can't give the medication um, or there's yeah. no one who can prescribe. So obviously it makes sense if they can just get hold of a doctor. My patient's in pain, sign this, then they can go give them the paracetamol the problem with that is that increasingly in modern medical training because as donia just said it's your prescription you know your name that goes on the prescription ultimately you are not supposed to prescribe for anyone for you know from a kind of moral ethical and legal framework that you have not examined yourself i think sometimes between particularly junior doctors and nurses this can tend to be a bit of a cause of aggression perhaps um so so prescribing you would like to be able to prescribe for your patients anything else yeah so that's the first thing um progression is another thing so there is progression for pas um as i mentioned earlier that you know you can become of a more senior pa in procedures or you can um sort of go into management you can be a lead pa and supervise a team of other physician associates 
um, there is a scope to go and sort of teach academically on a physician associate program um, and some physician associates are sort of course leads um, on those programs um, and there's the opportunity to get involved in research and there's a lot of lateral progression in terms of learning lots of different skills moving around different parts of the hospital and becoming skilled in procedures um, but in terms of a structured upward progression clinically there is not at the moment because there aren't any sort of postgraduate medical exams that physician associates can sit um, to demonstrate their competence and things like that so really it's ultimately about what you want for your career a lot of physician associates have you know will have gone into the profession and are perfectly happy with the current um progression that there is you know lateral growth or management and things like that for myself personally um, I want to be able to progress upwards clinically I think at some point there will be some sort of more hierarchy introduced within the physician associate profession they are already talking about um, potential for doing postgraduate medical exams things like that but again it's not going to be for some time it's probably going to be somewhere later in my career um, so that's another thing so the progression yeah um another point why i've decided to go into graduate entry medicine is sometimes having to justify my role all the time i find it a little bit frustrating mm -hmm. um there are a lot of skeptics of the physician associate role and it's just not nice going to work and sort of feeling like you're having to sort of defend yourself all the time so yeah i feel like that was an aspect i didn't like about the um physician associate role um which again is nothing, you know, it's not to do with physician associates, it's to do with sort of everybody else. I was going to it? say, it's the rest, that's yeah. a workforce problem, not a exactly. you problem. Yeah, um, um, and I suppose the last reason, which I mentioned earlier on, is that my parents live in North America. Um, I want to eventually, at some point, be able to live and work abroad. I want that freedom to be able to do so. Amazing. I mean, they're all, <laughs> I'm a, a, a little sad about that third one. <laughs> the, the, um, yeah. Because certainly that that's a that's a bit of a negative reflection on on doctors for certain. I, I can't speak for nurses, but the Faculty of Physician Associates or something, the yeah. Royal College of Physicians or Medicine yeah. or whatever it is, has a PA thing. That, so it's a regulated, um, maybe protected. I don't know whether it is a protected. It's not a protected title at the moment because the profession has not been fully regulated, um, right, okay. written into law, but essentially um, we're looked after by the Faculty of Physician Associates within the Royal College of Physicians. Yeah. And in order to practice, you, it's, there's a managed voluntary register. It, they say the word voluntary, but really I don't think any employer is going to employ you unless you're on that register, which means yeah. you've sat the national board exams in order to be a physician associate yeah so so again that's a parallel guys when you finish medical school you are provisionally adopted onto the gmc the general medical council kind of fitness to practice register that deems you qualified similar with nursing you don't get your nursing pin unless you are deemed to be safe and knowledgeable enough to be to be a nurse and again um pas have that similar process where as you say it's interesting even if it is voluntary in theory presumably it will cease to be when the profession is fully written yeah. in um but actually if they've managed to it's almost quite admirable if a profession has managed to self-regulate itself to such an extent mm. that its own register is deemed you know is, is deemed law kind of worthy by employers um, yeah it's very interesting let's go into then how did you I, I mean briefly i guess because that that's not the focus of this talk but how, how have you found the medical application process um it wasn't too bad to be honest with you to apply um i only applied to warwick that was the only place i wanted to go to so i suppose there wasn't much navigating in terms of sort of you know varying uh, requirements yeah, yeah. um but the work experience i already had that um, the you know undergraduate degree at two one and above I already had that it was just the UCAT and I didn't do amazing on the UCAT I sort of got a pretty borderline score to be honest but I think the year that I sat the test um, the scores were a little bit down so I thought why not apply and I got an interview and the rest is history so yes yeah, so you'll be um, so that Donya will be joining right as I prepare to sit my final exams <laughs> at Warwick 
this is terrifying um okay cool do you I, I kind of asked you this before before we started the talk but is there likely to be any any animosity or negativity from other PAs do you think about people I can imagine it almost being like someone defecting to the other side in mm -hmm. certain circles how have you had any negativity um not said to me personally no um I mean before I'd made this decision I had the offer for a while for Warwick so I originally applied um in 2018 to start in September 2019 entry but I deferred my entry because I was expecting my second child at the time. Congratulations. Um, so I, thank you, um, so I had this offer for a long time and I was sort of weighing it up and umming and eyeing over it um, for about 12 months actually before I'd fully decided that this is definitely what I'm going to do um, and in that time I had heard you know I'd been sort of around other PAs and I'd heard people talking about um, one or two physician associates that had decided to go and do medicine and sort of the conversation was negative um, in terms of some of the remarks that were made and sort of just the general attitude um, and so I suppose there is sort of this attitude that is there that's you know like oh well you think you're better than us because you're going off to do medicine um, and, and things like that and I think it's it's not helpful um, I think ultimately you know it's a very personal decision whether you decide to go and do anything actually after you've done you know whatever decision you make um and I don't think anybody should feel bad for it and I made my Instagram account because there is no sort of like online presence of PAs having gone and done this and that that was one of the reasons why I made the account because I felt I had nobody to speak to myself sort of in that 12 month period where I was really sort of struggling with the decision um I had nobody to speak to and I, I didn't want anybody else to feel that way so I wanted to open my account on Instagram so that you know if anybody was feeling like they wanted to go into medicine or they had an offer and they didn't know what to do that there's somebody there that they can see who's already done it and my inbox is always open for people to sort of message me and for me to give them advice and things like that. Amazing and you, you'll see on when this interview goes live uh, Donya's details will be where will I be I'll be down there <laughs> I've got that the <laughs> right way around um, but uh, they'll be on the video. So please shoot Don your message if you're in that position, because I don't imagine that it will be, I mean, it's niche, but it won't be crazy uncommon. There must be yeah. some number of people every year. Um, there is, there is. And I know people that have done it, both um, who were already at Warwick um, and who will be joining the same cohort as me, both at Warwick and at other universities. Mm -hmm. And I have had lots and lots of people message me since I've made the Instagram account. I was... In fact, I was expecting some kind of backlash and I was expecting animosity, but I didn't get that. I had lots of people messaging me saying, thank you for making this account. I've been feeling the same way and I thought I was the only one. Um, so I'm glad to have been able to sort of help out. You know, It's, it's really valuable. And uh, when I was talking to, it might have been Simon Fleming a couple of weeks ago, he, he used this remark, this, you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really it really is powerful more than I think people appreciate being able to see, as you say, people who have, who have walked the pathway that you yourself yeah. um, might be thinking of doing. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but you said you've been working in, in trauma and orthopedics and now, um, mm -hmm. now into a GP role. Do you have any views as to the type of specialist that you might want to be as a medic? I have no idea to be honest with you. Um, even as a student PA, there was lots of areas that I liked in medicine. Um, but I think I was viewing it with a different lens. So at that time, I was thinking, you know, some of these areas that I like, there's no jobs for PAs at the moment. So I, I need to sort of like get that out of my mind. Um, so I really enjoyed obs and gynae. I think there's a few obs and gynae PAs working across the country, but really it's a handful. It's probably less than five. You know, there's not many. Wow. Um, so my role, it was in trauma and orthopedics, but it was um, more of a medical role. So I was working mm. more with the ortho geriatricians. It was more of like a you know geriatric role. And I really liked that. I really enjoyed it. And I'm enjoying GP as well at the moment in my new job. Um, so I'm sort of keeping an open mind. Um, and I feel like it would be really nice to have those rotations again and think, oh, actually, I might be able to get a job in this specialty. I need to not discount it. So, yeah, yeah undecided at the moment probably the best way to be right yeah 
um definitely and i think i think you will find that experience you'll find that experience interesting i i was saying to you again before that even now into my, my final year of medical school, I've only ever encountered PA students a handful of times. And I don't know whether I've spoken about this before on the channel, but um, unfortunately the experience that, that I saw them witness, I remember being in a, I can't remember what type of surgical case I was in, but it was, it was myself and two PA students and wrongly you know c c clearly wrongly there was a bit of um nepotism if if you like the the yeah. operating surgeon was much kinder and more engaging with me because i was a medical student than he was with the pa students and i think mm. that attitude that, that's just something that we're gonna have to all collectively um collectively work on I guess they knew their stuff like they they knew their stuff just as well as I did um, yeah. yeah you know about what was going on but it maybe just again that lack of understanding about what they were there to do or what they were there to learn it, I just think it wasn't there I, I mean okay. I've certainly had experiences like that as well um on placement knowing that you know we're going to go to some clinics but if the medical students turn up then they get first dibs and we won't be able to go in the clinics and, and things like that so you know I've certainly experienced that and I think my experience that I've had as a PA going forward into medicine I'll probably be one of like the biggest advocates for the PA profession um going forward because I think it's so important that you know these additional roles are um, more widely accepted and just seen as normal in our healthcare system that we have. You know, the way that things have been in the past, they can't continue to be that way because it's just not efficient. Um, and, you know, we have a NHS that, that needs all these other staff, you know, all the other members of staff. Um, and I think really ultimately we have to think that we're all there as, you know, as one team, we're there for patient care and to put our patients first and sort of have to put all these other ideas to rest that you know mm. that you know somebody is better not better all that kind of stuff so yeah for sure and the bottom line as i was trying to say all the time on here is that if if your staff do not get along with each other or do not communicate mm. or behave appropriately it's the patient who suffers and they have nothing to do with your kind of squabbles about nhs hierarchy or yeah um or workforce provision and so on um so so that's really really important i guess a place to end would would just be as i as i like to ask everyone who comes on you know say you're out there you're maybe a pa student or a newly qualified pa or even an experienced pa who is thinking about making the switch do you have a piece of golden take-home advice oh, gosh. um I think ultimately, you know, it, it's a decision that you have to weigh up the pros and cons and it's a very individual decision. Um, you have to think about why you want to do it. Is it for the right reasons? Um, and ultimately, I suppose, for me, I thought, you know, if I don't do it now, I probably won't do it at all. And will I have regrets? And I suppose that's like the really important thing to think about, will you have regrets? Um, because if I you know if this doesn't work out for whatever reason I'm still always going to be a physician associate I still have my registration which I'm planning to keep up um so that's that's another thing you know will you have regrets and ultimately why do you want to do something is this going to be the right decision for you is it going to fit in with sort of your you know home life um your plans that you have for the future um, there's a lot to weigh up and I'm probably not the best person to give all this advice because it took me 12 months to make the decision <laughs> but um, it really helps to talk things through with people that you trust um, so you know that's probably the only advice I can give. Stellar advice I'm yeah. sure. Um, so as we've said guys Donna's uh, relevant information for social media and things like that will all be both in the video description and overlaid uh, on on the interview video that you're watching right now. Donya, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's certainly been very eye-opening for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Always, always a pleasure. And I look forward to, to meeting you at Warwick. I might be doing some, um, yeah. might be coming coming to you for finals teaching when I'm, <laughs> when I'm, 
preparing for my exams. Yeah, um, look forward to it. Cool. Take care. See you soon. Take care. Bye.